good morning, everybody. And you're looking at our Connected Souls Band with special guest Mike Jordan. And we have, of course, as always, Don Rao, uh, Donna Roselli, Doreen Pariba, Chuck Chase, and uh, like I said, Mike Jordan on the bass. So thank you, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Let me. Welcome. I'm the Reverend Jude Denning, and welcome to our Sunday morning celebration service. We'd like you to know that unity of Stewart is a positive, affirming, welcoming path of spirituality, and all are welcome here. Thank you for being here in spiritual community. Even as we are physically distant, we are spiritually connected. So we're glad you're here this morning. So we have some announcements, as we usually do. This is the weekly reminder that uh, to make sure you're on the email list, and that is at unityofsteward.org forward slash e-newsletter. Sign up for that so you can find out what's going on. Uh, you know, we're in an ongoing conversation about opening, and uh, we're still in conversation about it. The board meets on August 18th, and we'll talk about it again. So stay, um, stay informed by uh, subscribing to the newsletter. Uh, there's a survey that will be going out. Again, you've probably got it in your email box, and it'll today. And we've received so far 51 responses to the survey, and it's still open. So if you'd like to give your input, please, input, please complete the survey. All right. Uh, oh, and to answer a question that has come up more than once, whenever we reopen, whenever that is, we will still live stream. Live streaming is not going away. We'll live stream on Facebook and YouTube. So be assured that no matter whether you want to leave your house or not, uh, you can uh, check in with Unity of Stewart. Okay, Distance Reiki is coming up on, uh, as it does on Mondays, and that is with our Reiki master Cheryl Roby, and you can join that Zoom meeting, and there's the link. If you uh, need any information, you can email us at uh, admin at unityofsteward.org or me at revjudenning at gmail.com. As always, we will be uh, having our Zoom meeting after church. So come and join us at that ID number, and if you have any issues, you can also email me. All right, I do believe that's it for announcements. I'm a little excited today, I don't know if you could tell. Well, with Mike here and with we're, our special music today is We All Are One, and uh, Donna Roselli will be singing lead on that, and we did, they did. I didn't do anything. They did a bit of rehearsal before, and uh, it was fun, and uh, I got a little excited dancing along to We All Are One. So now it's time to settle in, take a breath, and I invite you to join me in dedicating our service to peace in our hearts and peace in the world. May this Christ light ignite in us a divine love that transforms our energy into purposeful action. Our daily word for today is stillness. And our affirmation is, I am peaceful and satisfied. Today I make time to be still and allow God to speak to the desires of my heart. I let go of any anxious, searching, or forcing solutions and open myself to spirit. I relax and focus on the rhythmic flow of my breath. The chatter in my mind quiets down and I ease into my connection with God. As I let go of worry, I feel the strength of steadfast faith. I take another deep breath and follow it into the chapel of my own heart. Here, I find stillness and rest. Divine love fills me with peace and satisfaction. I am calm and serene. All my needs are met 
and I am complete. In the peace of the stillness, I am deeply satisfied. I am peaceful and satisfied. And so we settle into this now moment, to this space of celebration of spirit and celebration of connection. And we know that the power and presence of God is right here and right now in us and as us, as peace, as joy, as harmony. And so it is. Amen. And let's affirm together our daily word affirmation. Together. I am peaceful and satisfied. And let's take that deep breath anchoring in this affirmation so every cell of our body feels the truth of this. As we affirm one more time together, I am peaceful and satisfied. And so it is. Amen. And now it's time for a prayerful meditation and we will be singing together, Be Still. And as that music vibrates in your physical body, I invite you, if you haven't already done so, to close your eyes and take three deep breaths of the living, loving presence of spirit at your own pace, dropping your shoulders, releasing any tension or concern, and setting the intention to be here now in this sacred space, in this sacred time. Be here now in the presence and power of the one. Mm, and as we dive deeper into prayerful meditation, I invite you to allow the words you hear to become the words of your own mind and heart. Sweet Spirit, I open my heart to the activity to the activity of love, to the activity of harmony, to the activity of peace moving in and through me. In this time of sacred stillness, I allow God to speak to the desires of my heart. I open myself fully and completely to divine wisdom and to divine guidance. And I relax and focus on the rhythmic flow of my breath. Dropping my attention to my heart, my mind stills 
and I ease into divine peace. And as I let go of all worry, I take another deep breath and follow it into divine peace. I am calm and serene. All my needs are met and I am complete. In the peace of stillness, I find that I am deeply loved and deeply satisfied. I am deeply loved and deeply satisfied in the quiet. And as we have co-created and settled into the sacred space of love and peace, of connection with spirit, I invite us to bring into our awareness all those who are on our prayer list here at Unity of Stewart and all of those who are in in our minds and hearts this morning, lifting each one up, praying and affirming that the infinite power and presence of the one is active in the lives of our loved ones and indeed in all people on our planet. And this is the time if you'd like to speak out the names of your loved ones into this holy space, I invite you to do that now. And releasing these loved ones into the care and keeping of the one. We pray this in the name and the nature, in the light and in the love of the indwelling Christ consciousness. And so it is. Amen. And again, our special music today features Donna Roselli singing, We All Are One.
all was different but deep inside The feelings were all made of hot that's the truth, isn't it? We all are one, despite appearances, despite what we see in the news, despite what we read in the paper, despite what we read on Twitter and Facebook. We all are one. And to support us in our oneness, we have been sharing, I've been sharing, uh, about the Ten Commandments that we're calling the Ten Challenges, based on a book called The Ten Challenges and other books. Uh, the book, The Ten Challenges, is written by a psychologist named uh, Leonard Felder. And we've been looking at these Ten Commandments as challenges, as ways to help us align our thinking. Align our thinking with spirit so we can be connected to spirit and connected to each other in meaningful ways. So the first four commandments are about our relationship with God, and the final six are about our relationship with each other. And so we finish up with the ninth and 10th commandments, and they are, don't bear false witness, and don't covet your neighbor's goods. I want to read to you from the book, The Ten Challenges, to talk a little bit about Felder's take on uh, this challenge. And he says this, one of the most misunderstood and overlooked of the commandments is the ninth which is usually translated as you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The commandment might at first consideration seem to apply only to making false statements in a court trial as it urges each of the trial participants don't falsify evidence, don't lie on the witness stand, don't let your prejudices about someone influence how you talk about them in court. It's the commandment that says to anyone involved in a legal dispute, don't lie or exaggerate. And he goes on to say, for many centuries, scholars and commenters have analyzed the ninth commandment to understand what is meant by don't repeat against your neighbor. Most experts interpret the meaning as don't lie or exaggerate when you talk about other people. Don't gossip about other people or guard your tongue and refrain from whenever, whenever possible from saying harmful or private things about other people. So it's about reducing gossip and hurtful talk. For our purposes, as we look at this challenge and um, fitting it into our lives, it's about reducing gossip and hurtful talk in our lives. Not always easy. As a matter of fact, there's a story about a new preacher who gives her first sermon to an already established congregation. And the sermon topic is the Ten Commandments. And as the new preacher preaches about honoring your father and your mother, the congregants are impressed and they, they say to each other, now that's great preaching. And when that new preacher starts talking about thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not steal, the congregants are nodding in agreement and whispering to each other. Excellent preaching, very moving. But when the preacher starts, starts talking about the ninth commandment and suggests, if we want to build a stronger sense of community and partnership, we've got to stop gossiping about each other and saying things behind each other's backs. 
a vocal member of the con congregation whispers loudly to the next person, now, that preacher's gone from preaching to meddling. So that's the challenge within this challenge. Most people don't have the inclination to become more mindful, to become more mindful about speech when it comes to others. And why is that? Well, a few things, I think. We might feel we're giving up something. The feeling of being equal to or better than others. The revenge we may feel when we ventilate resentment toward another. And the sense of satisfaction that comes when you know something someone else doesn't know. So those are some reasons why we might be reluctant to give up uh, talking about other people or talking about other people in, in good ways and in hurtful ways. It's something that we're so used to as a culture that it's hard to shake. But here are some of the benefits about cutting back on gossip and hurtful talk. If we do that, we live by the golden rule, treat each other as we would like to be treated. And when we question gossip, we amp up our social responsibility and fairness, particularly when we question gossip and generalizations about groups, people, and groups that are different than us, different than you. Remembering that even positive generalizations can be harmful. Say, all Asian Americans are good at math. Many of us have believed that or still do believe it. That's pressure on a whole group of people, not to mention the pressure uh, and the embarrassment on those Asian Americans who aren't good at math, because guaranteed, not all Asian Americans are good at math. So it's, it's good for us to be mindful about where we generalize and where we talk about other people. And maybe you've faced the challenge of confronting someone who makes a racist, sexist, or prejudicial remark. I invite you to think about it. If that's happened in your life, do you let it slide? Or do you say something? Have you said something and risk harming the relationship or making waves? Now, even though it may not be seen as socially correct or polite to speak up, maybe it seems like you're correcting somebody, the Ninth Commandment challenges us to point out when someone is spreading rumors or magnifying prejudice against people who are at risk. It can be awkward and lonely to speak out. And it's powerful when even just one person challenges a toxic belief and says, you know, I don't know if that's true. I, don't, I would do some research on that. It's worth the effort to speak up to make a better and more perfect world. Gossip generally says something about us rather than the person we are gossiping about. And I invite us to keep that in mind as we watch this video. There once was a girl named Rachel who loved to talk and she also liked to gossip. One day, she was gossiping about her friend Jacob behind his back. She talked to one person who talked to two people and all of a sudden everyone was gossiping about Jacob. They were even talking about him online. A few days later, Rachel saw Jacob and thought, Jacob isn't talking to me because I gossiped behind his back, but what can I do? Rachel decided to go to her rabbi and asked, Rabbi, how do I make things better with Jacob? The rabbi said, go get a feather pillow, cut a slit in the pillow, then bring it back to me. So Rachel went home, got a pillow, and cut a slit in the side. Immediately, feathers started falling out. She carried the pillow from her house back to the rabbi. But as she walked, feathers kept falling out. They even flew up into the sky. Rachel asked the rabbi, what do I do now? And the rabbi said, now collect all of the feathers that fell out of the pillow on the way here. Rachel was nervous. I can't do that, she yelled. They all flew away. And the rabbi said, just like you can't pick up the feathers you dropped, you can't take back the words you say when you gossip. Hmm. 
that's a powerful story and a powerful video about the effects of when we talk about other people and indiscriminately and without thinking how hurtful our speech can be. So what we are called to do is to speak the truth from the highest place in us, from the highest and best in ourselves, looking for the highest and best in others. So I challenge you in your conversations today, whether it's someone you know or someone in your family or someone you don't know, check yourself, check your judgments, and perhaps gently check them. So I invite you to think about this in your speech. Think, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? I invite us to be aware of our judgments and our motivations before we speak. Let's make the shift to lift this world up, to lift ourselves up, to lift our families up, to lift our friend groups up and look for the good in each other. Look for the good and share from that perspective. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? There's a lot in there to think about, and I invite you to do just that. And please remember, we are all doing our best wherever we are. Wherever we are in consciousness at any given moment, we're doing our best. And remember that as we continue our spiritual practices, we do indeed transform. All right, we're going to move on to the Tenth Commandment. Don't covet your neighbor's goods. And in our, for our purposes, this 10th challenge is about feeling good about what we have, about feeling blessed with what we have in our lives. Emmett Fox, in his book, The Ten Commandments, says this, coveting is painful. Neighbor's goods, neighbor's partner, neighbor's level of consciousness. Coveting brings disappointment, mental enslavement, he says, and despair. It could lead to anger, and hatred and further despair, which will lead to regret. It is a vicious cycle. He goes on, coveting implies a belief in lack. So they have something and I don't have it. And so coveting, at that point, we're telling ourselves, I'll never have that. that I, they have it, but I will never have it. Have you ever compared your insides to someone else's outsides? When you see that someone has something you want or that they look a certain way, you compare yourself. You compare yourself, maybe your outer, but also your inner, you know. They say, I read all the time, it's you know, with people on Instagram and Facebook, generally, we put forth our best life, our best pictures. We, most of the time, we don't put our pain or our sadness or our despair on Facebook, on Instagram, on social media, and neither does anyone else. So when we compare ourselves to that, we're doing ourselves a great disservice, a great disservice. If you want to feel bad about yourself, compare yourself to someone else. It's a disease, this disease of comparison. You know, and it's fostered in our culture. Anytime we watch television with commercials, we see that we're not good enough, we don't smell good enough, we don't drive the right car, we don't have the right things, we don't take the right drugs for crying out loud. We're constantly being told that we need something else in order to be good or to be better or better looking or better accepted. We should be different, we hear, than what we are. There is no spirituality in that at all, not surprisingly. The spirituality, the tool is in recognizing that what our culture has done, be aware of it and then disconnect from that disease of comparison. Become ever more aware of who you are, perfect, right where you are. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't want to change or that we don't want other things or that we don't want to lift our lives up or lift up our financial lives. It doesn't mean that. What it means is to seek first your connection with source. To seek first the connection with source and then it becomes clear what it is that's our heart's desire. And then we go after that. Instead of coveting what someone else has, let 
that coveting inform us about what our heart's desires are? And I invite us to know that as we think about all this, that really what we look for in our lives, what our deep human needs are, is security, love, connection, to matter, to belong, to have respect. And it does no good to compare ourselves with other people. Well, not for nothing, but they all want that too. Everybody wants that. Instead of suffering from that comparison, which shows up when you see someone that has a bigger house or a nicer car or those shoes <laughs> or that degree, let's acknowledge it and then do the spiritual work to align ourselves with that good. And here's a great affirmation for that. It's uh, by Emmett Fox in his book, The Ten Commandments, and I'm going to bring it up for you. Here's the affirmation. I am in touch with the source that brings that. I embody the consciousness that brings that. Let's take a deep breath into that prayer and affirmation. If we are always longing to be like someone else, if we spend our lives wishing we had something someone else has, we lose our way, we lose sight of our own divine path, we lose sight of our connection, and we are not present to the divine inspiration that lives, moves, and has its being in and as us. Here's a teaching story from the Jewish mystical tradition. There was a Hasidic rabbi named Rabbi Zuzha. Zuzha was a timid man, a man who lived a humble life. And one day, Rabbi Zuzha stood before his congregation and said, when I die and have to present myself before the celestial tribu tribunal, they will not ask me, Zuzia, why were you not Moses? Because I would say, Moses was a prophet and I am not. And they will not say, Zuzia, why were you not Jeremiah? For I would say, Jeremiah was a writer and I am not. They will not say, why were you not Rabbi Akiba? For I would tell them, Rabbi Akiba was a great teacher and scholar, and I am not. But then they will say, Zuzia, why were you not Zuzia? And to this, I will have no answer. We are called to be exactly who we are on our own path, on our own path of love, of harmony, of inspiration, and of guidance. Here's some wisdom from writer Alan Cohen. Rather than envying the victories of others, surf on them. Put yourself in their position and share in their delight, as if their triumph were their own. I'm going to say that again. Put yourself in their position and share in their delight, as if their triumph were your own. See it as a call from spirit that is guiding you to express a new vision in your life. When someone succeeds at something you desire, they demonstrate that your goal is attainable. Because it has come into your awareness, you, because it has come into your awareness, you are that much closer to attaining it yourself. You know, when I was a decade or two ago, when I was thinking that I wanted to be a minister, that I wanted to do this work in the world, and I thought I, there would be times when I thought, oh, I am just not capable of doing this. I'm not holy enough. I'm not uh, high enough. I'm too human. I have resentments on all of that stuff. I don't have what it takes to be that. And then what I thought was, if one person can do that, if one person, if one woman can be a successful minister, if one woman can lead a congregation, if one woman can do it, guess what? So can I. So I began to not compare myself to other ministers, but to look to them for inspiration. Yes, I like that. I, I can see doing that. And if one woman can do it, so can I. And so that's what Alan Cohen is telling us, that, telling us in this quote. Surf on someone else's success. Surf on someone else's joy and laughter and abundance and prosperity and health 
and wholeness. Because when we do that, it opens up a place in us to have that too. It opens up a welcoming place in us. Spirit longs to express through us. This is the meaning of living a spiritual life, to be open and aware of that and to allow that space for spirit to express through us and as us. To discern what God would have us do and be and then go do and be it. We are that in expression, divine love, divine peace, divine satisfaction. Let's be present to that. Let's detach from coveting. The more we detach from coveting, the more we are present to what spirit is calling us to be and do in our lives. That's the practice. I am in touch with the source that brings that. I embody the consciousness that brings that. Seek first. Seek first the connection with spirit. You know, this commandment brings us full circle, thou shalt not covet, brings us full circle back to the first commandment, the first challenge that we shall have no other gods before us, that we are present to that power and presence that is within us. That's what we are called to be led by. Our teacher, Jesus the Christ, sums it up in this affirmative way. When asked what is the greatest commandment, the Christian New Testament depicts Jesus paraphrasing the Torah. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Before paraphrasing a second passage, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Let us be peaceful and satisfied. And so it is. Amen. And so let us take that deep breath together as we move into our celebration of abundance and thanksgiving, bringing up places where you can continue to give to unity, unity of Stuart. And once again, as we, I, I do every week, we are grateful. We are grateful for your presence, we are grateful for your love, and we are grateful for your financial support that is keeping Unity of Stewart whole and healthy. Thank you, it makes a difference. And now let us pray our prosperity prayer together. In a universe overflowing with the allness of God, all of the needs of unity of steward and those we serve are instantly, constantly, and bountifully met. From every direction, known and unknown, expected and unexpected, our abundant good comes to us now. We are grateful. Amen. And our love offering blessing. Together. Divine love, through me, blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. I give and receive always in love. And now, let's bless our youth and family ministry. And before we close with the prayer for protection and the peace song, I want to thank our, our music team uh, with guest Michael Jordan. Let's, let's look at a picture of them again. There they are. And uh, before we close with the prayer protection and the peace song, I want you to know that at the end of the service, we'll be debuting a new composition by Don Rao. So stay tuned for some beautiful music. Let's affirm the prayer for protection together. The light of God surrounds me. I am light. The love of God enfolds me. I am love. The power of God protects me. I am power. The presence of God watches over me. I am presence. Wherever I am, God is. I am divine. And now let's close with the peace song.
in love, stay in peace, stay in wholeness, stay in prosperity, and we'll see you soon. Namaste.